stand together as we prepare to enter the Lord's presence today. His presence is already here. We know God wants to do great things. What a wonderful looking crowd tonight on this Wednesday night. It's almost as if you think there's snow coming <laughs> and then maybe you can't come back Sunday. It probably is not going to happen on that degree. But anyway, let's worship the Lord tonight.
starting to see all the way from the little tap on Brother Scott's seat back there in front of him that he was doing with his pocket knife <laughs> up here to Sister Jenny and Sister Beth and, and the Pulliams just lifting their hand and clapping their hands. All that praise to God tonight is so encouraging and it's so uplifting in Amen. this place tonight. It's great to be up here and look out there and see you responding because you know, if, we're, if you're not, then it kind of feels like we're not really getting our job done up here, right? right. <laughs> but God's Spirit's moving in this place tonight. We're going to take our needs before Him right now. And if you have a specific need that you would like to mention, you can do that at this time. There are some on the screen already. But does anybody have anything they want to mention tonight? Unspoken. Okay. I will just mention uh, about Chuck that they did have to add a bypass oxygen. It's not a ventilator, but anyway, it's kind of a step down from a ventilator. Monica, I saw her dad, and she did, they did find out that she does have uh, three spots in her brain that she does have cancer also. But she did start her, her treatments, and so. Chuck, they need the Lord to touch their bodies tonight, and we also need to continue to remember our community that God would continue to reveal truth to them and not only that, but that they would also open up their hearts to accept it. And on that line, also remember my friend Angelique that I told you about on Sunday. Um, she wants to receive the Holy Ghost, and, and um, I believe that God is ready to give that to her. I believe that He already is filling her up with the Holy Ghost and she just doesn't realize it. So we just pray for her tonight that she would um, be able to open up and, and give praise to God because she told me the other day that she has it from her background and the way she was raised and, and the type of church that she went to and all that she has a hard time uh, lifting her hands even because it wasn't something that they regularly I guess done and so we just need to pray for her to be able to have freedom in worship. That way she can receive the Holy Ghost. All right, let's take these needs before the Lord. Go ahead and call out your own need and call out all the other needs that you heard off of. And I'm sure that I'll probably miss some. Um, so I don't want to anybody's need to go uh, unprayed for tonight. So let's go ahead and go to the Lord. Lord, we praise you tonight. We thank you for another opportunity to come into your up and, and make it all about you, God, and tonight we bring needs before you, Lord. We pray that you would have your way in each one of them, God. I pray right now for cancer that was mentioned tonight, God. I know that you can heal cancer. In the name of Jesus, I pray for every person, God, that's dealing with it right now, Lord, that you would strengthen their bodies tonight, God, that you would help them and lift them up, God. In the name of Jesus, I pray right now for your healing virtue to flow from through their bodies from the top of their heads to the sole of their feet, God, and touch them, Lord. Hallelujah, in the name of Jesus. I pray right now for Chloe, God. I pray that you would help her, Lord, give her patience and strength as she prays for answers, God, in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. I pray for Chuck tonight, in the name of Jesus, God. I pray that you would touch his body, God. God, give him the breath that he needs, Lord, in the name of Jesus. Touch his lungs right now, in the name of Jesus. God, I pray for every need that was mentioned in this place tonight. God, whatever it is, you know all about it. 
And Lord, I pray that you would just move by each person tonight and encourage them and strengthen them in your spirit, God, that they would have their needs met through you. In the name of Jesus, right now, I pray for Pensacola, Lord. I pray for all the surrounding community of Pensacola, Lord. Each person, each soul that is in this community, Lord. I pray that you would pour out your spirit upon them, God. I pray that you would help them to be able to understand and recognize that it's you, God, that is moving by them. In the name of Jesus, I pray right now, God, that you would give them receptive hearts, Lord. In Jesus' name. Hallelujah. I praise you, God. We know everything is possible, God, when it comes to you, Lord. House of the Lord with each of you tonight. Thank you, Jesus. If you have your Bibles tonight, turn with me, please, to Acts chapter 2, verse 42 through 47. Acts chapter 2, verse 42 through 47 is where we'll be reading from as we pick up where we left off last week. And last week I forgot to give you your handout, so we're going to do that right now. <coughs> Brother Ben, there's also some pens back there. If you need an ink pen, raise your hand. As he's coming around, we'll make sure that you get an ink pen. So we're starting out behind tonight because you should have been filling these handouts out last week. And so we're going to give you an opportunity as we review here very quickly to fill in those blanks. So the good news is I won't be running off and leaving you like I usually do. <laughs> and you have to come and ask me about it later. Again, we're reading from Acts chapter 2, verse 42 through 47. We've got a real fancy title, but it is a bare bones lesson. Um, we have to learn discipleship principles if we're going to be successful Christians. And um, that whole idea is a philosophy that is being challenged every single day by our culture. Uh, we live in a consumer culture, and so we're talking about the war between daily discipleship and Christian consumerism. So yeah, that's a fancy title, uh, but it's not a lesson that's hard to understand, although it might be difficult for us to receive. And the Bible tells us that the carnal mind is the enemy of God. And so we need uh, to prepare our hearts to receive the word and be willing to buck the trends of this age that we live in. Somebody say amen. amen. The way we do that is just go back to the book of Acts and decide that we're going to have a church that is reminiscent of that church. A church that does not reflect whatever is going on today, but a church that is sold out, a church that is on fire for God, a church that is, um, is doing everything that it can to 
propagate and share the gospel to our lost world. Acts chapter 2, verse 42 through 47 shows us what they did with the Holy Spirit that had been poured out upon them. They had been filled with the Spirit. They had obeyed the plan that was given to them for this uh, grace age. They had repented of their sins, been baptized in the name of the Lord, had received the Spirit. And now this tells us what they did after that because it's not how you start, it's how you finish. Amen? We need more than a good start. But we need a strong finish. Acts chapter 2, verse 42, and they continued. Everybody say continued. Continued. It says they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and in breaking of bread and in prayers. And fear came upon every soul. And many wonders and signs were done by the apostles. And all that believed were together and had all things common and sold their possessions and goods and parted them to all men as every man had need. I forgot to put the scriptures up there, so hopefully you're following along on your own. And they continuing daily with one accord in the temple, verse 46, and breaking bread from house to house, did eat their meat with gladness and singleness of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the church daily. Everybody say daily. 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 He said the the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. Nothing gives me... Uh, greater pleasure as a pastor than to receive a call uh, on a on a off day, a day we're not having church, and and somebody be wanting to be baptized, to have a Bible study going on, and and people decide to follow through on the plan of salvation right then and there, and begin to uh, walk with God, and it is God's will that we be a daily church. But in order to be a daily church, that requires a level of commitment and consistency that is very, very foreign to uh, the generation that we live in. And so this is called daily discipleship uh, against consumer Christianity. Now, we're going to fill in these blanks here. Everywhere that you see a highlighted word, that goes in a blank on your page, and we're just going... In order, So these are things that we learned last week. If you sow a thought, you reap an action. If you sow an action, you reap a habit. If you sow a habit, you will reap a character. And if you sow a character, you will reap a destiny. They say you have to do something at least seven times for it to become a habit. You have to do it consistently before it uh, becomes a habit. It's one thing to pray. It's another thing to have a prayer life. It's one thing to have an experience with God. It's another thing to have a walk with God. And if we're going to be a church that truly impacts our world, we have to be a church that is in tune with God, a church that... A, we have to be a person that has a relationship with God um, so that we can be ready, we can be uh, there for people who have a need, we can be tuned in uh, to the spiritual needs that are around us, and those needs are around us continually. You know, I wonder how many times Peter and John walked by the same lame man that was sitting at the gate beautiful. Because they they went to the temple as a matter of routine. But it was on a particular day that they suddenly noticed him. I wonder what the difference was. I think the difference was because they had just come out of a powerful move of God. They had just been filled with the Spirit of God. They had just received the Holy Ghost. And right after that, we see them... Uh, ministering to this lame man in a way perhaps they ministered to before perhaps at other times they had um, had some change to throw in his cup and to help him get through another day but on this day they were prepared to minister on a spiritual level you cannot give what you do not have what you do not possess and um, it's one thing for us to possess the things of the world um, to share with people, but it's another thing when we have a, that spiritual dimension 
and we're walking with God and we're sensitive to, uh, to the needs that are around us. And I want to be that kind of pastor. I want to be that kind of uh, Christian. I want us to be that kind of church because that's the kind of church that our world needs. Amen? Amen. So it's a daily church. Um, and as I talked there, you should have had time to fill in all your blanks. Action, habit, character, destiny. It's a progression. If you'll keep doing it long enough, it's going to affect who you are. It's the same way with sin, really. Sin doesn't start out in the worst form. It starts out as a sin of ignorance, okay? And then it becomes a transgression. You are aware of the fact that you should not be doing that. You've been taught against it. The preacher has warned you. And so now you are numbered as a transgressor. You are one who is willingly and, and uh, routinely or habitually going against the command. That's a transgressor. The final stage of sin is iniquity. And iniquity is whenever you've done it so long that it becomes who you are. And then when you say, you know what, I don't want to do that more anymore. Now you're in bondage to it. And you need deliverance. It's not just a simple decision. That's the progression of sin. And it's the same way with uh, becoming what we need to be for God. It happens over time. It happens many actions until those become habits, until that forms our character, until we come into our destiny in God. So uh, just as people in the world are consistent in their sin, we should be every bit or more consistent in our worship and our service to God. And that's how we become what God wants us to be. The book of Acts is God's blueprint for building his church. If we want to know how to have church, how to be the church, we just read the book of Acts because that is the historical record of what the church was uh, when it came into existence originally, the New Testament church. And we don't, we don't need to go to councils and creeds hundreds of years later to find out uh, what kind of church we should be. Let's just go to the book of Acts. Let's follow the blueprint. Okay. Uh, your next blank there tells us that Acts chapter 2 shows us the first New Testament church service. That was a powerful church service, wasn't it? So we know that our services should be powerful. Our churches should be full of of preaching and praying and response to the word of God. Acts chapter 2 verse 38 shows us the New Testament pattern for obedience to the gospel. I've heard people say Acts 2.38 is the gospel. Actually, Acts 2.38 is the altar call. It is the application of the gospel. The gospel is Jesus died for your sins, he was buried, and he rose again on the third day. That's the gospel. He's the only one that ever did that. That's the good news. But our response is we become a part of what he did by repenting of our sins, being baptized in his name, and being filled with his spirit, death, burial, resurrection. So it's obedience to the gospel. That's the blank, the gospel. Acts chapter 2, verse 42 through 47, which I just read to you, is the New Testament pattern for discipleship, just as there is a pattern that shows us how to have church and how to respond to the gospel, there is a pattern in the book of Acts that shows us what it means to be a disciple, to truly become a follower of Jesus Christ. Discipleship. Now, as the early church began to do these things, they began to have their church services that were full of power, they begin to apply the gospel that had been given to them, and they begin to, uh, or they continued in those things steadfastly and became examples of the believers to others. Then we see something happen um, that is very powerful in Acts chapter uh, 6. It says that the uh, church was multiplied. Let's see if I can find that scripture here. Acts chapter 6, verse 7, And the word of God increased, and the number of the disciples multiplied in Jerusalem greatly, and a great company of the priests were obedient to the faith. So notice this, that whenever 
they started on the day of Pentecost, the Bible says the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. But whenever those people became disciples, as they applied the word of God to their lives, something amazing happened, and that was the church could no longer be described as being added to each day, but the church began to be multiplied. You know how the church is multiplied? The church is multiplied when it's not just Peter preaching the message, but it's the people who heard Peter preaching the message, living the message, and then re-preaching it, telling someone else about the goodness of God on a daily basis. So that's where it is. The power is in uh, the, the adding of disciples and those disciples then beginning to do what they have already seen in action. Uh, the key to our church overspreading our community is not how good pastor preaches or it's not even um, how good of an administrator I could be. It's really not, uh, those things are important. But what's more important is what each of us do with that church service. What each of us do with the word of God that's given to us. Because as we live it, then the word of God increases. It multiplies. Amen? Amen. And so we have to make sure um, that we do that. I think I, I left out a slide here. Uh, five discipleship habits that we uh, learned from last week's lesson. We have to learn habits of ministry, prayer, evangelism, Bible, and and using our time, talent, and treasure for the kingdom of God. And those key words there are enlist, voice, extend, read, and yield. Those are discipleship habits that we have got to uh, apply to our lives if we're going to see the church grow the way that it needs to grow. Every child of God needs to be involved in ministry. Every child of God needs to involve themselves in the daily discipline of prayer. Every child of God needs to be involved in evangelism. Every child of God needs to read the word of God. And every child of God needs to be yielding their time, their abilities, and their treasure uh, to the work of the Lord. That's the pattern that we see of discipleship in the New Testament church. And it will work. Uh, in its application today, just as it did then. It will work today. If we do not do those things, then we are going to severely limit the work of God in our community and put that on the shoulders of just a few people. And, and that's not how it gets done. It doesn't get done um, by just the work of a few. It doesn't get done with just a sermon on Sunday and this lesson on uh, Wednesday night. Hey, is everybody caught up on the blanks you're filling in? Mm -hmm. Yes, ma'am. What is the last one? The Y? Yield. Y-I-E-L-D, yield. Yield your time, talent, and treasure. All right, so that brings us to our lesson tonight. Last week, we really focused just on the idea of daily discipleship and what that looks like. And tonight, we're going to talk more about the battle that we are up against with this idea of consumer philosophy, consumer Christianity instead of a Christianity of service, which is what Jesus taught us, a Christianity of sacrifice. Jesus said, if you're going to follow me, if any man's going to follow me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. Take up his cross. It it's represents sacrifice of self, not a, not a, um, I'm looking for the right word, a coddling of self, a catering to self. That is the antithesis of what Jesus desires out of his people. At every point in turn that his disciples exhibited that behavior, when they came up and said, uh, Lord, grant it whenever you come into your kingdom, um, let my sons, one sit on your left hand and one on your right hand. Jesus said, no, 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 that's not the way that it works. Now, if a person is going to attain such a position in the kingdom of God, 
let him be the servant of all. In the kingdom of God, the way up is down. And the quickest way down is to try to exalt yourself. He that exalteth himself will be abased. Amen. And the one who is the servant of all is going to be, in due time, lifted up. That's the way uh, the kingdom of God works. Well, I've been, I tried that. I served everyone. I was, I didn't get any thanks. I didn't get any praise. I, nobody ever noticed. Well, who said your rewards even in this life? Can we not wait 70 years <laughs> for, you know, for the reward in terms of, I know I say that all the time, in terms of eternity, what's 70 years? You know, we live this life as if it's really a long time, but trust me, when you get to the end, you won't be thinking, boy, that sure was a long life. <laughs> I can tell you at age 48, I'm saying, where did it go? And Brother Poy was saying, well, you're just, a, you're just a boy. You're just a young man, <laughs> right? From where he's sitting today, a few years ahead of me, he's saying, what are you talking about? You've got all kinds of time. But it happens for each of us. And, and trust me, regardless of how long you live in this life, it's not going to seem long at all when we get to the end of it. What really matters is eternity. And there, that's where we're going to receive our reward. Jesus even said, if your goal is the praise of others and you receive that, congratulations. You've got your reward. That's it. That's it. And um, that's going to fade away. But there's a crown of righteousness that will never fade away. And the way that's attained is uh, getting the approval of the one who really matters. That is attained through walking with God on a daily basis basis, regardless of whether there's accolades, regardless of whether or not people notice, just living your life, doing what you do as unto the Lord. So here we are more than 2,000 years later, and we find ourselves in this daily battle. Now, I've heard it said by so many, you know, if the apostles lived in this day, man, they would just be shocked. They couldn't, they couldn't make it. How could they uh, you know, we, woe is us. We've got it worse than anybody else. Temptation's worse in the day than it ever was. And the truth of the matter is, perhaps in our culture, in our civilization, that is true, that America is not the America that it was, you know, 175 years ago, um, 100 years ago, even 50 years ago. It's apples and oranges to what it used to be. But the truth is, every civilization goes through it. Rome wasn't built in a day, and Rome didn't descend into decay in a day. It happened over time. Um, in the Old Testament, Abraham was told that, uh, when the, that the iniquity of the Amorites was not yet full. In other words, God was not going to judge them. There was going to be a 400-year period go by that his people would be in bondage but that God was faithful, he was going to return to them, and he was going to judge the enemy at the appropriate time. And so there is a, there is a lot of time that goes by that we don't see the things happen um, that perhaps we thought would happen. Um, and the result of that is that we look at our world and we say temptation is greater today than it's ever been. Now, granted, there's things in our world that didn't exist but what has always existed is the same avenues of temptation, and that's the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. And believe you me, Adam and Eve were just as captive of an audience to that one forbidden tree, right? right? Don't you know that every day, I mean, it was just them and that tree, right? Every day, that one thing that they were told that they were not to partake of, and it's no different today than a person and their cell phone that they just can't sit down. There's a, a new technology, but the truth of the matter is the, the avenues of temptation have always been the same uh, and remain the same. I know I'm taking a long time uh, to say that, but what I'm trying to say is in the day that the apostles were living, it was not an easy culture to live in. When Paul went to Mars Hill and began to preach when he went to the temple of 
the goddess Diana and they shouted him down for the space of two hours. There was no respect for the ministry. There was no respect for what he was saying. Um, so the world was just as evil in that particular society. It was just as evil as what we are experiencing today. It all comes full circle, then it starts over, repeats itself. And so here we are, we have two philosophies that are at war, and our generation it happens to be the culmination of iniquity in our world, okay? We're at that place where America is on the, the slippery slope and is quickly descending into really a sociopathic, narcissistic society uh, that is nothing of what it, what it started out to be. How does that happen? Serving self, doing what we want to do 100% of the time, not denying ourselves. That's how we get to that place, is uh, doing what our carnal nature desires. And so as the church, we are the called out ones to stand up against that and lead by example. We can't make one other person do uh, differently than what they're doing. We do not have that power to coerce someone to live for God, to change their ways. Not one of us has that power. But we do have the ability to lead by example. And I can guarantee you nobody's going to do something they're not seeing example. If we as a church are, that, are the same selfish group that they see every day in society, that they're not going to be drawn uh, to that a uh, different example. They'll just continue on the same way that they are. So um, there is the world's way, consumer culture, and there's the Jesus way, and they are completely opposite worlds. The way of Jesus Christ is a world of sacrifice, submission, humility, and patience. It's the worldview where God is at the center and his disciples live for him and for others. In the Jesus way, it's not about us, it's about God. But this other philosophy, which I just referred to as consumer culture, which dominates society today, is a world of consumption, assertiveness, speed, and fame. That's what it runs on. In the consumer world, it's all about me. In the Jesus way, Jesus is the center. In the consumer way, man or self is the center. And the consumer culture has created the consumer church. That's what we're battling now because consumer church gives us what? Consumer Christians. So what are you talking about, Pastor? Well, let's just look at it a little deeper here. The consumer Christian culture is all about receiving benefits and getting into heaven. That's the consumer culture Christian mindset. Its story is about man rather than God. It's about an environment of instant gratification, the condensing of scripture into neat formulas, worship that's centered on personal needs and taste. It's about Christianity without any sacrifice. The consumer Christian culture makes us become more and Jesus become less. Oh, the difference in attitude of, of one John the Baptist, who Jesus said was the greatest prophet that ever lived. And man, there were some great prophets. But Jesus said, in all the existence of humanity, there's never been a prophet greater than John. But yet John said, he must increase and I must decrease decrease John the Baptist knew for lack of a better term how to slow his roll right he knew how to turn down the desire for self accolade uh, for um, praise to be heaped upon him and he knew how to direct that to the Christ he was the forerunner he was the one in the wilderness crying, prepare the way of the Lord. In our generation, you know what? We need some people that are willing to, to cry out in the wilderness in a place that's not, it doesn't even look habitable, doesn't look like that there's any place for the things of God. But he said he was crying out a voice in the wilderness, a voice in the most unlikely of places, 
a voice in an unreceptive uh, environment saying, prepare the way of the Lord. Make his path straight. The Lord is coming. And here we are just before the second coming. And who is going to be that voice? It's his church. We have to be that voice in the wilderness, leading by example, preparing the way of the Lord. And uh, John was definitely that example um, of sacrifice, of um, the term self-deprivation is not the right term, but, um, but putting self on the back burner and living his life completely for the purpose of the Christ that he was advocating for. Consumer Christian culture, as I said, makes us become more and Jesus become less. And as I also said, it's not really a new thing. It actually had its beginning all the way back in the Garden of Eden when Satan manipulated Eve into disobeying God while believing that she was enriching herself. See, that's how it works. The appeal is always to self. Well, the devil made me do it. No, the devil didn't make you do nothing. The devil convinced you to do what you wanted to do, right? Because self has desire to please self. And so what does the devil do? He just convinces you to do what you want to do. And, and so um, if he can cater to that consumer desire, then um, he has a good chance of convincing us and deceiving us because he's appealing to our own desire to please ourselves. So we're in two worlds that are at war. We need to understand that, that this is not an optional thing. We are at war. We have a mortal enemy, and that mortal enemy is our selfish desire, our carnal humanity. That is the enemy that fuels consumer culture that now has invaded the church. The alarming thing is that many good Christian people live their lives every day without ever really realizing that they've been seduced by their culture. And that's why it's my job as pastor to stand up here and remind us that we cannot successfully serve those two philosophies at the same time. There's the Jesus way and there's the consumer culture way and we cannot meld those together. Churches have tried it. And it is not, it, it doesn't end up being church, okay? If we had 100 people here right now, 100 very unconsecrated, undedicated people, that would not be a church. It would be something else. Now, we could boast about the crowd that we have and how much, how, what a great time that we have together and, and how good the music is and all that. But if there is no sacrifice, if, there, if it doesn't resemble what Jesus called us to do and called us to be, then that is not the church that he purchased. That is not the church that he said, upon this rock I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. It's something else. It's a false church, an imposter church. And we've got to make sure that we don't uh, allow ourselves to become that. So we cannot serve both philosophies. Jesus t said it this way. No man can serve two masters. For either he will hate the one and love the other. Or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. Jesus said, don't be fooled. This has already been attempted. It never works. You can't serve two masters. You have to make a choice. Joshua said, choose you this day whom you will serve. Why did he have to say that? Because that war was going on then. Are we going to do what we want to do? Or are we going to go the direction that God wants us to go? And Joshua says, as for me and my house, we are going to serve the Lord. Um, every church is dealing with this right now with um, the past two years. We're, believe it or not, going to the third year of COVID. And... Um, our church has in many ways been affected probably the least because we're in a rural area. Um, and our attendance probably hasn't been affected as drastically as other churches, but it's a struggle all over the nation. Declining church attendance. Um, 
post COVID. Okay, and I know they COVID, they say COVID's still going. We got another rendition of it now uh, coming out here, um, and so it may never be completely over. But something that has happened in the midst of COVID is we have introduced this option. You know what I'm saying? Like church can be convenient. If you, if you don't feel good today, don't worry about it. Just uh, we have it online for you. Now, the truth was most a lot of churches had church online. We had church online before COVID. But just something about the mentality of Americans especially has changed, right, over the past couple of years. And it feeds into that, that whole thing of consumerism. If... If it doesn't work out for me today, if I got other things I feel like I need to be doing, um, well, I can just I can just watch church a little bit later on. You know what I'm saying? It's it's a, it's a um, a kind of thing that doesn't happen overnight. It just kind of slips in. But I will guarantee you this: if I stood up here, I was talking about this a little bit today with my with my son, and I said, you know. Um, we, if we're not careful, we begin to, to lose our dedication, our consecration, and we begin to just slip a little bit here and there, and we just begin to see things as not as important as it used to be, and, and it could be done other way. I said, but I guarantee you, if I called a meeting of the church, and I said, after prayerful consideration, and gave you all that whole, that, all that jazz, you know, and said, I've just calculated the cost, and really I think it'd be more efficient if we just sold all this property and eliminated the overhead, technology will do the work for us. We can all watch church services from our home, and I'll just do the job. You send in your tithes and offerings, and, and the church will be more efficient, and this will be so much better. I don't think that we would get very many takers on that. Would you agree? I don't even think people that, that have begun to slip into that mindset of, well, maybe I'll come today, maybe I won't. Maybe I'll come Wednesday, maybe I won't. I don't even think they would like that idea because the truth is we know what church is supposed to be. Right. We know it's a community of believers. Right. We know that it, it, it we, we know that we're not to forsake the assembling of ourselves together. And so the truth is if it was put to us in those concrete terms, not one person, I don't think, would say, Pastor, I'm all for that, mm -hmm. right? Because we want the church to be there when we need the church. But we need to understand as disciples that the church needs us. And as I said, um, um, our church has probably been the least affected. I'm not up here to gripe, but I am here to sound the warning that in every way, um, and I'll be talking to our praise team about, I do it every year, talking about commitment, you know, and, and, um, and being prepared to do the work of God. It has to be a conscious decision that we say, I'm going to deny self, and I'm going to do the will of God, because otherwise, every single time, we will do what our flesh desires to do. It's a great myth of consumer Christianity that after a period of time, we know enough, and we've cleaned up our life enough that we can get by without practicing the daily uh, discipleship habits, those kind of actions that build our dependence on God. The discipleship habits require us to take repeated actions over and over again, and consumers don't like that, okay? So that's why we have to be on top of this whole consumer culture trying to come into the church. If I was a pastor that was going to yield to consumer culture, I would be very, very concerned about... Um, what kind of music should we sing in the church? Why? Because we want the consumers to be happy. We need to make sure if we have this certain dynamic in the church, we make, make sure that we have a certain exact ratio of, of hymns. And if we have a younger church, then we need to make sure that we're giving them the latest Hillsong and Bethel and all that. And um, I don't operate like that. The reason why is because I'm just going to sing whatever I feel like we need to sing. If I feel like that we need to sing glory to his name, we're going to sing glory to his name. Um, if we need to sing the old rugged cross, we're going to sing that. Um, but we have to be careful because if we begin to 
become people pleasers. It's one thing to try to minister to people on their level, to connect with them. That's one thing. But it's another thing if we're willing to sacrifice uh, biblical principles and truth uh, just to attract the masses. Uh, because the consumer will leave as soon as they find something that caters to them uh, just a little bit more. We're, we're in the business of making disciples. Another great myth of consumer Christianity is that individual rights, individual thoughts, individual needs are paramount. This is a serious shift from the way that Jesus um, teaches and the way that his way values community or in Bible terms we would call that the congregation. The congregation, the local home base where our Christian life is formed, where our identity is developed. The congregation, it is not about us, it's about God. God's plan is to create a new community where his disciples learn to love him by loving one another. In biblical terms, worship is equal to sacrifice. So we gather together to contribute to each other's lives. We set aside our personal agenda. We, like Jesus, choose to live the life of submission to others to put their needs equal to ours, or in many cases even more important than our own. But consumerism that tries to come in to the church, it's a business concept based upon customer satisfaction. Customer satisfaction It says that um, that is the only thing that, that matters. The customer is always right. That is the foundation of any successful commercial enterprise. The product or the service has to be tailored to the wants and perceived needs of the customer in order to have a sustainable profit. The consumer is in charge because if there's no customer, then there's no profit, and then therefore there is no business. But in biblical Christianity, God rules, not the customer. Okay? One person came out of a church service uh, one Sunday and said, I, I really didn't care for that. And their friend replied to him and said, well, that's good because we weren't worshiping you. As just kind of a wake-up call, you know. Every apostolic church, here's a blank you need to fill in. Every apostolic church in the 21st century, when I say apostolic, I mean churches that are striving to be like the apostles. Every apostolic church in the 21st century has an opportunity to have a revival like they had in the 1st century, but it doesn't happen just because we preach the same doctrine. There's a lot of churches preaching the doctrine, but they're not having revival because revival that they had only happens when we have the same level of discipleship. It wasn't the doctrine only, but it was the continuing steadfastly in those other things as well. The apostles' doctrine, but also the other things that were key to discipleship. It will not happen because we make one commitment in one service either. We got a lot of times that we have a powerful service, a powerful move of God, and we have an altar service and we renew a commitment, but it takes more than a one service, one moment kind of thing. It only happens if we live these things every day, and those things are enlisting, voicing, extending, reading, and yielding. It's involving ourselves in the ministry of the church, in prayer, in reading the word, and in yielding our time, talent, and treasure to the work of God. I'm simply out of time. Let me see if I can very quickly wrap this up. Have you ever heard of the Pareto Principle? The Pareto Principle. The principle states, it's also known as the 80-20 rule, the law of the vital few, the principle of factor sparsity, and it states that for many events, roughly 80% of the effects come from 20% of the causes. In terms of property, 20% of the people own 80% of the land. And that observation was the basis for the Pareto principle. Bill Pareto, Pareto um, noticed that 20% of the people were owning 80% of the land. And here's the thing, uh, this applies in every area but 
when you use the word own, that sounds almost like a dirty word in this concept. You're basically saying this is no fair. The rich people have all the land. The poor people don't have anything. But there's more to ownership than possession, right? With ownership, there comes a lot of responsibility. Um, let me put it in very, very uh, common human terms everybody will understand. Uh, my wife and I have owned two homes in our life, and neither one of those were a good experience whatsoever. Okay? We choose today to rent. We may rent. Now, I'm not, I'm not telling you not to rent. I'm telling you why that we rent. Why that we rent is we do not want the responsibility that comes with owning property. Because that not, did end up being a good experience for us. Now, for a lot of you, that's been a good experience. And so, I'm, again, don't, don't say that I'm saying you shouldn't own property. Not saying that at all. But I'm saying that some people, when you talk about buying into what the church is doing, taking ownership, being a part, the truth is that that requires responsibility. And so the reason why that 20% of the people are producing 80% of the results in almost every area of life is this idea of responsibility. It's not always that, oh, it's unjust. Marty doesn't own his home, and here the rich guy, he owns all this land next to him, and that's not fair. No, that rich guy has had to sacrifice a whole lot to maintain that piece of property, and Marty just said, you know what? That's not worth it to me, okay? So we have to also understand that that is part of consumer culture in the spiritual dynamic is we're not going to get everybody to buy in because to buy in and really become a vital part of this whole idea of daily discipleship, it costs us a lot to do that, okay? Um, I'm three minutes over already. Let me hurry. I'll be done by five after, or by, yeah, by five after. Uh, sales, 20% of the customers buy 80% of the product. Products, 20% of the products produce 80% of the profit. Reading, 20% of the book contains 80% of the content. Speech, 20% of a presentation gives 80% of the impact. Job, 20% of our work gives us 80% of our satisfaction. Time, 20% of our time produces 80% of our results. Problems, 20% of the people take up 80% of our time. Donations, 20% of the people give 80% of the money. Organization, 20% 20 of, 20 of the people do 80% of the volunteering. And have you noticed this? If you have a party, 20% of the people will eat 80% of the food. <laughs> <laughs> That's the Pareto principle. They apply it everywhere. And as we move further into consumer culture, even that rule is changing. Now they're talking about the 1090 gap. And another scholar suggests that we are now seeing the 99 one rule. But the point I want to make is that in uh, when it comes to the church, the 80-20 principle is not an apostolic principle. The Bible says they had all things common. They were all invested. They were all in and they were they saw this as the most important thing happening, the work of God. And I just want to close with this tonight and say as we begin to go into 2022, as we begin to move into our new building that's going to allow us to expand. It's not just a building expansion. It has to be a people expansion. As far as our uh, involvement, um, we'll, we'll have more classes. We'll have more things to do. We'll have places to have it all. Thank God for that. But at the end of the day, we need people to step up right now. We need the church to begin to step up in order for us to achieve the growth potential that our new facilities are going to allow us in the future. And so that's why I'm, I'm harping on this right now, daily discipleship habits. Because if I will do these things, it will allow God to use me in a greater way. It will help me to be tuned in and be ready for my assignment that God is going to uh, help me to grow into as the church grows. We want to make 2022 not about what we get from our church, but what we are going to give to the church. And I'm not referring cheaply to money when I say that, that's just one dimension of giving. To yield that discipleship habit, our time, our talent, our treasure. If we make this year about what we are going to get from the church, guess what? We will have a very disappointing year. 
Not because there's nothing here for you. Not because there's nothing to receive, but because it's just a fact. The less that you put in to anything, the less that you will get out of it. The satisfaction and the happiness of people on the pew, it will be related to how connected they are to the vision and to what is being done in the local church. You have people sitting on the same pews and one be very unhappy and one be very fulfilled. Why? Probably because the one is very disconnected and isolated and really not taking part and the other sees everything as an opportunity and they're involved in whatever they can be involved in. So just purpose, I'm going to uh, be a part of greater vision just as they were a part of the early church. I'm going to continue steadfastly, not only in the doctrine, but in what makes us a body and a family as a church. And if we will do that, we can push that 80-20 principle uh, right out of our thinking, and we can see uh, greater involvement on many levels in our church. And as we do that, everyone that takes part in that, guess what? There'll be growth. There'll be satisfaction. So there's... There's a different way. There should be satisfaction in the church, but it should be based on that consumerism mentality where we just try to cater to every desire. But it should be by getting us all to buy into the vision of what God has for our church and for our community. Well, I fib to you. It's 807. Let's stand together. I tried my best, but it's 807. Thank the Lord for each of you. In the house of God tonight, especially our first-time guest with us tonight, what a wonderful opportunity for us to be together. We'll see you Sunday at 1030. Let's be here ready for another great move of God on Sunday. Lord, we thank you for this night. We pray you would go with us, protect us. Lord, those that will be driving tomorrow, if there is bad weather, we pray your protection upon them. Bring us back safely on Sunday to worship together again. In Jesus' name, amen. Oh, I'm sorry, I forgot the question.